We all know Jill Valentine is a zombie slaying, oversized, shoulder pad wearing badass, and she's been a staple of the Resident Evil series since way back in 1996. We haven't seen her in the past couple titles, and you know what? I miss her. So I'm going through her whole story. It's the Jill Valentine timeline. The Jill Valentine timeline. Before Resident Evil 1, 1974 to 1998, Jill Valentine was born in September of 1974 to a French father and Japanese mother. Her dad, Dick Valentine, is rumored to be a mobster as well as a master thief. I say rumored because it's not exactly canon, but hey, it's interesting, so it's staying in. Perhaps using the Thievius Raccoonus, he helps raise little Jill to be an adorable snoop and teaches her to unlock all sorts of things, like my heart. However, instead of robbing banks and art galleries, Jill decides to use her skills to serve her country. Once she turns 18, she joins the US Army, where her sneaky abilities like lockpicking and bomb defusal garner the attention of the higher ups. She is quickly recruited by the elite Delta Force, taking on the world's most challenging and harrowing counterterrorism missions. Her heroics catch the eye of a Mr. Albert Wesker, so in 1996, he recruits her to the Special Tactics and Rescue Service, or STARS, in the Raccoon Police Department. Yeah, I know, that sounds like a downgrade, you know, Raccoon City is just a mid-sized Midwestern town. Well, apparently it needs the most elite soldiers for their special police teams. Jill quickly earns a spot on STARS' alpha team as the bomb disposal expert. Resident Evil 1, The Mansion Incident. July 24th, 1998. In the summer of 1998, there's strange reports of murder and potential cannibalism in the Arclay Mountains on the outskirts of Raccoon City. There's been about 20 deaths since May, but everyone just chalks them up to grizzly bear and dog attacks. After months, the RPD finally assigns STARS to investigate. How crime-ridden is Raccoon City, seriously? On July 23rd, STARS Bravo team helicopters into the remote mountains, but quickly loses contact. Must have lost their train of thought. So, the following evening, Jill Valentine and the rest of Alpha Team fly on in. This goes poorly, as they're soon attacked by a wild pack of Cerberus zombie dogs and Brad Vickers helicopters away like the coward he is. Now, Jill and the rest of Alpha Team have to madly scramble towards the one area of refuge, the Spencer Mansion. Once inside, she and Barry Birkin separate from the rest of the team to investigate gunshots. While Barry takes his beard and hand cannon to investigate a puddle of blood, Jill wanders through the hall, only to discover a zombie snacking away on a member of Bravo Team. Understandably freaked, she retreats to Daddy Barry, who quickly dispatches the rotting, walking corpse. With Wesker and Chris Redfield now gone from the main hall, Jill and Barry split up to explore what's going on in the Booby Trap Mansion. Jill, the master of unlocking, winds her way through the mansion, solving puzzles and eliminating zombies to uncover more of the massive estate. She even finally puts her countless hours of piano lessons to good use. Barry doesn't completely abandon her, though, as he saves her at the last minute from being crushed by a booby trap ceiling. She was almost a Jill Panini or something. Jill also runs into Richard Aiken of Bravo Team, still alive but dying due to a nasty snake bite. She's able to save him by tracking down a serum, but Richard unfortunately dies later on by sacrificing himself to save her. In a shack behind the mansion, Jill runs into Lisa Trevor, the tragic, mutated survivor of the Umbrella Corporation's twisted experiments. This nefarious pharmaceutical company is responsible for the development of the T-Virus in the mansion outbreak. Jill survives and carries on to fight her way further through the mansion, defeating bioorganic weapons like a giant snake, giant shark, giant plant, and a variety of hunters. Cerberuses, and zombies. When she gets to the caves under the mansion, she meets Bravo's Enrico. He tells Jill there's a traitor within stars, but he's assassinated before he can say more. After driving Lisa Trevor to suicide by revealing the corpse of their mother, sad, Jill finds herself in the secret Umbrella Laboratory, and all their evil doings become clear. She discovers that stars leader Wesker is the Umbrella employed traitor, and this whole incident was set up to test BOW efficiency in the field against special agents. Wesker unleashes the ultimate BOW tyrant, but it backfires. The monster knocks the sunglassed backstabber aside, then turns its sights on Jill. Jill and Barry manage to stall the tyrant before rescuing an imprisoned Chris and escaping to the mansion's roof. While the lab and mansion are set to self-destruct, Jill has one final confrontation with tyrant before blasting into smithereens and escaping, as Brad finally returns in the midnight hour after Resident Evil 1. After the mansion incident, Jill and her cohorts want to launch an investigation into the evil of Umbrella in Raccoon City, but the slimy police chief Irons shoots them down. Most of the remaining STARS members take a European vacation to see what's going on with Umbrella over there, but Jill stays behind to unlock more of their secrets in Raccoon City before joining her friends. Resident Evil 3, September 27th through October 1st, 1998. Too bad Raccoon City is going to hell. See, the water supply ends up getting contaminated by the T-Virus. By September 27th, most of the citizens are zombies, and we a full-scale City of the Dead situation on her hands. It's time for Jill to make her last escape. 
First, she gets chased into a warehouse where she spends the night with terrified novelist Dario Rosso. No, no, not like that. The next day, she leaves Dario to his own devices and meets up with her other coward buddy, Brad Vickers. Brad warns her of a monstrous beast tracking down members of stars one by one, the Nemesis T-Type, a highly intelligent tyrant equipped with a hulking body and a rocket launcher. While Jill and Brad are retreating to the RPD police station, Nemesis attacks them and takes the pilot down with a tentacle through the face. Jill fends off Nemesis as she works her way through the mostly abandoned station eventually getting back out to the mean streets of Raccoon City. From there, she meets up with a small team of Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service agents, mercenaries hired by Umbrella. Just like with Stars, Umbrella is using this team as mere pawns to test their BOWs. Jill hates teaming up with Umbrella, but she has no choice. So, she, Corporal Carlos Oliveira, and Sergeant Nikolai Zinoviev work to repair a tram car so they can escape to an evacuation site with the injured Captain Mikhail Victor. They find the necessary repair parts, but not without seemingly losing Nikolai in the process. The three survivors start moving on the tram towards the evacuation site of the clock tower, but Nemesis ambushes them. Captain Victor uses a grenade to sacrifice himself and buy Jill and Carlos enough time to escape. With Nemesis stalled, the two make their way to the tower, ring the bell, and signal the evacuation chopper. Too bad Nemesis shows up again and blows it out of the sky, destroying all hope for a desperate duo. At this point, Jill's had enough so she greatly injures Nemesis and forces the monster to retreat, but not before it infects her with a strain of T-Virus. As a result, Jill's sick for two days, while Carlos ventures to a nearby hospital and finds a cure. Once Jill is better, she and Carlos fight their way through more of the city and a giant sewer worm until they arrive at an umbrella incineration disposal plant. There, they learn that the military is going to nuke Raccoon City to contain the outbreak. There's a spare helicopter on site, but that traitor Nikolai turns out to be alive and makes off with it, in my playthrough at least. Fortunately, Barry is on the way to save her, but first, Jill has to put Nemesis out of commission. She knocks it into a giant pool of acid, then shoots its final form with a railgun. As if that wasn't enough, she delivers the final blow herself. That blow being a sick one-liner. You want stars? I'll give you stars. Jill and Carlos escape as the city explodes behind them. Umbrella's end, February of 2003. Four and a half years later, Jill and Chris are working for an anti-biohazard team when they hear about some zombie-esque activity in the Caucasus region of Russia. Umbrella must be afoot. In a small village, they find a lone surviving little girl, a bunch of undead, and a somehow still alive and super-powered Albert Wesker. He's there to collect research. See, turns out some villagers work for Umbrella and are storing BOWs. After a standoff in a grain silo, Jill and Chris discover that the monsters are coming from a nearby Umbrella base disguised as a chemical plant. It's Umbrella's last stronghold and houses all of their vital data. So. When Jill and Chris raid the place the next day, it seems like the evil pharmaceutical company is finally cornered. But Colonel Sergei Vladimir unleashes the T-Virus throughout the facility as a last resort of defense. Even worse, he also sicks the computer-aided tyrant, Talos, on Chris and Jill. The hordes of zombies, supercomputers, and BOWs prove no match for a battle-hardened duo, as Jill is able to easily dispatch all of her foes. But she isn't quite quick enough. As Chris and Jill attempt to recover the remaining umbrella data, Wesker beats them to the punch. As a big F you to his former employer, Wesker Wesker transfers this data to Uncle Sam, and Umbrella is forced into bankruptcy. Eh, you know what? Let's give credit for the fall of Umbrella to Jill anyway. She's way more likable. Resident Evil Revelations, 2004 to 2005. Now that Umbrella's gone, Chris and Jill co-found the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance, or BSAA, to counter future BOWs. Sure enough, a new bioterrorist organization known as Il Veltro attacks the city of Terra Grigia with BOWs in the spring of 2004. The FBC, a federal counter bio terrorist organization decides to give Terra Grigia the Raccoon City treatment and just destroys it, this time with a newfangled solar satellite. A year later, Jill and her new partner, Parker Luciani, head to the city's abandoned beaches to investigate masses of mutated corpses. They find out Chris has gone missing, so Jill and Parker beeline to his last known location in the middle of the Mediterranean. They find a cruise ship called the Queen Zenobia, ravaged by the t virus and a horrifying new group of monsters called the Ooze. Jill tracks down what looks like a tied-up Chris, but turns out it's a dummy with even less personality than the real Chris. It's a trap, and Jill and Parker get gassed into unconsciousness. When they come to, they soon reunite and fight their way through the ship looking for survivors. They find FBC agent Raymond Vester, but even with his glorious hair, he's kinda suspicious. I'm getting Wesker vibes, and Conan O'Brien vibes. Fighting further through the ship, Jill takes down the buzzsaw-wielding Skagden before popping in a video for a movie break. The video shows Il Veltro's leader, Jack Norman, using the T-Abyss to turn a bunch of guppies into Jaws threatening beach vacations around the world. Also, FBC leader Morgan Lansdale plans to destroy the Queen Zenobia with the same satellite that destroyed Terra Grigia. 
I mean, Jill stops that from happening, but all these organizations and nefarious plans are giving me a headache. Thankfully, Chris and his new partner, Jessica, arrive at the ship to rescue Jill, and our heroes confront an agent of Il Veltro. But of course, it's actually Vester. I knew I couldn't trust that comb over. He hints at a larger conspiracy before Jessica straight up shoots him. Turns out that Lansdale and the FPC actually helped orchestrate Il Veltro's terrorism to boost its own PR and funding. See, Jessica is actually working with the FPC. That's why she tries to silence Vester before he can say too much. I mean, he survives, but anyway, back to Jill. She tries some more fun and exciting things, such as injecting herself with a prototype vaccine chock full of tea abyss and swimming through infested waters. Eventually, she escapes the Queen Zenobia before it self-destructs. She and Chris then track down leader of Il Veltro, Jack Norman. He has gone absolutely mad trying to get revenge on Morgan Lansdale. Norman thinks Jill and Chris are working with the FBC, so he overdoses on tea abyss to transform into a monster for, you know, a final boss. But Jill is Jill. She destroys this new tyrant and acquires the evidence needed to put away Morgan Lansdale for the rest of his days. Also, for the record, this whole tanker chapter was put together by Clive R. O'Brien, the guy who runs the BSAA. He was trying to expose Lansdale. He was working with Vester, you know, the whole thing. You know what? Let's just get back to Jill's story. Lost in Nightmares, August of 2006. A year later, the BSAA has tracked down Umbrella co-founder Oswald Spencer to his mansion in Europe. Jill and Chris storm the estate in the middle of the night to arrest him, and to get a lead on Wesker, only to find a handful of new monsters. But once again, Wesker is one step ahead. He's already murdered Spencer. Then he shows off his super speed in a battle with his former subordinates. Chris and Jill are no match, but before Wesker can finish off Chris, Jill tackles Wesker through a window, and they both fall hundreds of yards to the abyss below. After a lengthy, fruitless search, Jill is declared dead on November 23rd, 2006, but she's actually alive. Wesker also survives and puts her in cryostasis as a guinea pig for Ouroboros. Yeah, yeah, a new virus. Fortunately, the T-virus that Nemesis infected her with eight years back is still in her system and makes her immune. Unfortunately, the antibodies her body produces allows Wesker to perfect Ouroboros. And to make matters worse, all these tests turn Jill blonde. Wesker turns the newly blonde Jill into his personal superpowered henchman using a chemical called P30. Thanks to a device on her chest, Jill gets a steady stream of P30 and mindlessly carries out Wesker's orders. It was originally going to be attached to her head, but the developers figured they'd throw in some fan service and put it on her chest so she can pull a Hulk Hogan to reveal it. You're welcome, Jill fans and Hulk Hogan fans. Resident Evil 5, March of 2009. Jill dons a new cloak and plague mask and heads to Kajuju, West Africa to aid wise guy Ricardo Irving. He's a bioweapons dealer who's responsible for infecting the local villagers with a strain of the Las Plagas virus. Chris, his new partner Sheva Alomar, and the BSAA are there to investigate, but Jill unleashes Ouroboros in the village to thwart them. From there, she keeps protecting Irving, leading Chris and Sheva Alomar around through mines, swamps, and oil fields. After Irving has delivered his payment, Jill coerces Irving into injecting himself with dominant species Plaga to transform into a giant monster and fight Chris and Sheva. Then, she hops in a speedboat and returns to Wesker. Eventually, Chris and Sheva find a disguised Jill in Wesker's hideout slash laboratory, where they have an intense fight. Jill seems to be winning, even without a gun, and Wesker shows up to gloat and fully reveal her true identity to her former partner. After another quick scrap, Wesker leaves Jill to finish them off, but Jill is more strong-willed than Wesker anticipated. When she hears Chris say her full name, Hulkamania kicks in. She begins to fight against the P-30 and reveals the device in her chest. So, Chris and Sheva pin her down, and Chris uses his boulder punching strength to yank the device off of her. At this point, Jill's too exhausted to pursue Wesker. So while Chris and Sheva chase after him, she escapes with BSAA captain Josh Stone. The two battle their way through hordes of monsters as Jill relays vital information to Chris and Sheva on how to defeat Wesker via virus serum overdose. Eventually, they reach the escape helicopter. The pilot gets killed, unfortunately, but Jill and Josh are able to fly away. But not to safety. Not yet. First, they have to save Chris and Sheva from Wesker in that volcano. Once those two are on the helicopter, they fire two RPGs right at Wesker, destroying him once and for all. That's nice and all, but Jill's body and mind are completely worn out from the virus experimentation and mind control, so she enters rehabilitation, and that's the last we've seen of her. She was resting up during Resident Evil 6 and 7, but I'm sure she'll be back. She must be chomping at the bit to kick more ass. So now we've covered Leon and Jill. Which character should we cover next? There's Wesker, there's Chris, there's Wesker, you let us know. All suggestions and players are welcome here at the leaderboard, so why not subscribe? Now, time to go make a sandwich.